Thank you, Bob. That was excellent. Our next speaker uh, is Michael Udell. Michael is an assistant professor in the Department of Community Health and Prevention at Drexel University School of Public Health. Dr. Udell has also held the positions of researcher in the molecular laboratories at the American Museum of Natural History, right here where we are today in New York City, where his work focused on genome policy and ethics and the position of health policy analyst at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, where he worked closely with the Institute's ethicist and deputy director on human genome project policy. Dr. Udell is the author with Rob DeSalle, also of the Museum of Natural History, uh, of Welcome to the Genome, a User's Guide to the Genetic Past, Present, and Future. He is currently completing the book Making Race, Biology, and the Evolution of the Race Concept in 20th Century American Thought. Professor Udell. Slides. How's everybody doing today? Good? Bad? Nothing? Let's see. I'm a Mac guy, so let's see. Let me open up PowerPoint. Okay, it works. All right. Uh, thanks for that lovely introduction. I uh, appreciate it. Um, thank you to Kathy Sloan and Shelley Krimsky for asking me to be here today, to my fellow panelists, who I am honored to be sharing this podium with today, and of course to Rob DeSalle in the back of the room, um, who helped train me here at the museum. I, I got my PhD in a joint program between here and Columbia and spent uh, actually, most of uh, my time here working on what I'm going to talk to you today um, here upstairs. So uh, it's a real treat to be back here um, talking in this room. Actually, the last time I spoke here was with Rob for our last book called Welcome to the Genome. We had these dual podiums up here, and we gave a dueling speech. So it was a lot of fun, and it's good to be back here. Um, so my talk today uh, considers through an historical lens, I am a historian, um, why the race concept remains ingrained in biological thought um, and what lessons we might draw from that history. Uh, my talk focuses on some findings from a book that I've just finished uh, that was just mentioned called Making Race, Biology, and the Evolution of the Race Concept in 20th Century American Thought. Um, and I hope that there are some lessons from that book that are useful uh, to both tell us why the race concept continues to persist in both biology and in popular culture, um, and what we might do about that. Um, and I'll talk generally about uh, the history of the race concept in the 18th and 19th centuries very briefly, and then I want to tell two stories today um, from my book, um, one about W.E.B. Du Bois's critique of the race concept at the beginning of the 20th century, and the second about Theodosius Lipschiansky, the great evolutionary biologist, uh, reworking of the race concept at mid-century. Um, now, let me say first that I think it's safe to say that most folks who do what I do, that is historians and social scientists, believe that the race concept is socially constructed, um, meaning that it's biological, meaning that the biological meaning of race is constrained by the social context in which racial research has taken place. Um, the way scientists think about race today, after all, is different than it was in the wake of the civil rights movement when some promoted black genetic inferiority as an argument against egalitarian social policy and certainly different than one or two centuries ago as scientific justifications for slavery and later Jim Crow were articulated. In other words, um, and uh, our previous speaker pointed this out, race is an idea with a measurable past, an identifiable present, and an uncertain future. But let me be clear in saying this, that this in no way alters my view that studying genetic differences between peoples can improve our understandings of human evolution and disease, and that the relationship between genetics 
and human diversity remains a critical area of scientific inquiry. I just think that race is the wrong way to do this. Um, now, just a brief story. I'm going to take my jacket off. It's a little hot up here. When I started working on my dissertation here, now about uh, nine years ago, um, it was around the time when uh, the genome sequencing was finished. And uh, of course, we have President Clinton flanked by Craig Venter, then the head of Celera Genomics, and Francis Collins, and the head of the National Human Genome Research Institute at that White House press conference that's been mentioned already, talking about how we were 99.9% .9 the same, how race was not a meaningful biological construct, but rather a social construct. Um, and I thought, wow, I'm going to write a book that concludes with um, the biological race concept starting to really lose traction in both science and society. Well, sadly, I was wrong. Um, now, you can see here the, the quotes from both Venter and Collins uh, at that event or soon after. Uh, Venter says, the concept of race has no genetic or scientific basis. Collins says, those who wish to draw precise racial boundaries around certain groups will not be able to use science as a legitimate justification. Well, things quickly change for those of you who follow these debates in the sciences. Um, Collins changed gears pretty rapidly. This is in 2005 where he says, we need to try to understand what there is about genetic variation that is associated with disease risk and how that correlates in some very imperfect way with self-identified race and how we can use that correlation to reduce the risk of people getting sick. Neil Risch, who's a prominent genetic epidemiologist, um, I think he's at UCSF now, says, identifying genetic differences between races and ethnic groups is scientifically appropriate. But then you see the split among biologists. David Serre and Svante Pabo at the Max Planck Institute say, even for a rough and rapid evolution of genetic risk factors, racial background is of limited use, and direct analysis of the relevant gene is the only reliable way to evaluate genetic risk in an individual. And Venter is even more forceful in his dismissal of the use of race in science, saying, I don't see that there's any fundamental need to classify people by race. What's the goal of that other than discrimination? Um, now, there's the paradox that we're stuck in right now, and I'm going to talk in a few minutes about why I think we're stuck there. Um, but first, just a, a, a brief background on the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, the race concept itself was introduced into the lexicon of the natural sciences by the French naturalist Buffon. Um, now, although race was new to the natural sciences, the idea of human difference and the ideas of human differences being grouped um, in what we would consider a racist way was certainly not. Um, but Buffon brings those cultural and folk ways into uh, the emerging field of biology in the middle of the 18th century. And what Buffon writes um, about the human species is that the blood is different, but the germ is the same. The type is general and common, as if by any great revolution man were forced to abandon those climates which he had invaded and returned to his native country. He would, in the progress of time, resume his original features, his primitive stature, and his natural color. Now, from today's understanding of human migration and evolution, we would know what the answer to that would be. But of course, Buffon was a European um, and believed that the people lying between the most temperate uh, climate, lying between the 40th and 50th degree latitude, produces the most handsome and beautiful men. It is from this climate that the ideas of genuine color of mankind and of various degrees of beauty ought to be derived. Europe. Um, so you see these rationalizations occurring in the middle of the 18th century um, during a period of colonial exploration. Um, and Buffon's ideas about racial differences were rooted in climatological theory. He believed that climate changed peoples as they spread about the world. Um, now, in the United States, Thomas Jefferson, we know him certainly as uh, the third president and a great political philosopher, was also one of our earliest and most prominent 
natural scientists and wrote in addition to his very important words in the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal, wrote in a book called Notes on the State of Virginia, which is one of, considered one of the great scientific books of its time, um, that the difference between the races is fixed in nature and that blacks were originally a distinct race. So there you see the paradox that is inherent certainly in American political history, but Jefferson is also laying out what becomes um, part and parcel of the history of science in this country. Um, now, during the 19th century uh, in the United States, anthropology um, also begins to develop and come into its own here, um, and led in part by a group of scientists who called themselves polygenists. Um, and polygenists believed in the separate creation of what we think of as races, but to them, they were actually separate species of humans on the planet, and that correlated with skin color. And the gentleman who quote unquote proved that theory um, was a man named Sam Samuel Morton, uh, who practiced out of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And he believed that by measuring skulls and showing cranial capacity from different populations around the world, he could prove that there was a hierarchy of uh, racial species across the globe, um, and that that hierarchy co uh, correlated with certain um, social and behavioral traits, um, including most prominently intelligence. Um, what is interesting, and this is one of the skulls uh, that from Morton's book, what's interesting about Morton um, is that more than 100 years later, the evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould um, went back, went to the Anthropology Museum at Penn where Morton's skulls are housed, and redid his experiments using his skulls, the lead shot that was filled into these skulls and the, the actual uh, cylinders that measured, and Gould found um, n no difference between racial group and skull size, and figured out that despite Morton as being hailed as the great objectivist of his age, which is an actual quote from a newspaper article in Philadelphia at the time um, Morton published his findings, um, that Morton was either consciously or unconsciously under and overstuffing the skulls of different peoples around the globe. So he would take the Caucasian skulls and just jam that lead shot in there until they had you know, really high uh, cranial capacity, and then he would take the skulls from other parts of the world and kind of, you know, gently pour, and, oh, that's enough, and then make his measurements. Um, whether it was conscious or unconscious, we obviously cannot know. There's no indication one way or the other in the historical record, but it tells you about the power of the race concept and how it is integrated into scientific thought both then and we'll talk a little bit about um, why that remains so today. Now, historians um, are in general agreement that race, as I said, is a product of history, not of nature, that beginning at the end of the 18th century, science plays an increasing role in defining and delineating racial differences, that in the 19th century, racial differences were primarily understood as typological, and that meaning that it was an observed trait, something that you could look at um, and uh, predict based on what you thought you saw that that person belonged to one group or the other. But something changes at the beginning of the 20th century with the rise of the eugenic movement and of genetics that racial differences become primarily attributable to genetic heredity. So we move from a system that measures difference um, visually to one that measures difference genetically. Um, sci uh, historians also in the literature for the most part believe that uh, scientific racism in the 20th century has generally focused on its alleged rise and fall. The, 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 most history books look at there's an arc during the 20th century where scientists are practicing quote unquote racial science and that in the wake of the Holocaust that changes and becomes less accepted in scientific circles. My book shows that not to be the case and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, another problem with the history is that it rarely intersects with African American history so you have historians talking about um, race um, in an American context without talking about its relationship to actual people. Um, and uh, racial science becomes an important component of white supremacist thought during the 20th century. 